Thank you. Short. Go this way. I'm a little shorter. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs>
a couple spots down here. If you have spots next to you, raise your hand. So people fill in. Yeah. Looking good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I want to go ahead and get started. So uh, my name is Amanda Cook Vesperman, and I'm the chairwoman of the IVCC diversity team. I want to welcome everybody to our annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Writing Contest winners reception. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to the winners and their families for being here today, too. This is the last event we have in our celebration of Black History Month. Uh, we are going to be moving on to Women's History Month very, very soon here. And uh, I know we have an event coming up on Friday. I know because I'm speaking at that event. I know it's at noon, but I don't know the location, uh, but I can tell you to look out for that. So at noon, uh, Dr. Raddick and I will be speaking about uh, the F word, that's feminism, uh, and uh, the women's march after the election. So um, that will be this Friday at noon, but I don't have a room number on that yet. So I will get that out as soon as I possibly can. So I want to introduce our winners today. So we have a, we always have an unusual situation when we have the Dr. King contest in that we usually end up with a tie. Um, and this year we actually had a record number of entries into the contest, which is really exciting. Really, really good entries. If you entered and don't find yourself up amongst these people here today, let me tell you that the people who didn't place were incredibly close to the people who did. So there were really good entries. And it actually resulted in, in really seven ties. Uh, two ties for first place, three ties for second place and two ties for third. And so the diversity team decided that the right thing to do was to award all of those places. So that's what we're doing today. So I will introduce our winners. We'll start with third place winners and we'll move our way up to our first place winners. And they will come up and they will read uh, their entries. So um, our first third place winner is Adam Falkenhayn. So Adam, if you'd come up, please. All right, how's everyone doing? Good. All right, the first uh, thing I'm going to read is a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King himself. The ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty of, by bad people, but the silence over that by the good. <clears throat> so I just moved uh, into my new apartment. I needed a break from unpacking. It was a new area that I lived in, um, so I'd been moving things around for about 12 hours and I decided to watch uh, the local news and get a sense of the regional issues of my newest place of rev residence in St. Louis. Uh, I don't remember what channel it was, could have been an NBC affiliate, uh, but it didn't matter because it was the same story on every single channel. Um, the small groups of people could be viewed uh, behind the anchor. Um, all gathering around a location where a young African-American man had been fatally shot by a police officer. Uh, this was different than just a typical local developing story, and I was witnessing the first few hours of the Ferguson incident. Now, I'm a married, straight, white guy. I've faced very little oppression in my life, um, and I've always respected Dr. Martin Luther King uh, the same way most Americans do, with the general acknowledgement of his significance in American history. I mean, this is one of America's undisputed heroes. This is a man who, through peace and decency, set an example of inclusion that set our nation further than possibly any other man in American history. While his words always, excuse me, while his words are always remembered and highlighted, it was through his actions that real revolution occurred. Regardless of every single year of reflection on his words and deeds, um, of Dr. Martin Luther King on, on the holiday that bears the name in late January, I never emphasized the struggle and power of diplomacy until just recently. In the weeks following the Ferguson event, I was working with school-age youth throughout the city of St. Louis uh, at a before and after school setting, uh, and the predominant population of the students were African American. I didn't really know how to engage these children um, after the incident. So with the entire city buzzing and a lot of people talking about it, I didn't really start the conversation, I just listened. And I heard a singular voice of disillusionment toward an authority, uh, the constant concern these kids felt as their lives were somehow less significant than others. I realized the struggle and I was angry alongside with them, alongside them. 
I felt responsibility. I felt guilt that in all my days of acute loneliness, heartbreak, anger, and apathy, I never felt insignificance due to the color of my skin or the perception of my culture. I kept listening to these young voices and stayed infuriated. I decided to join some organized marches and protests uh, that called for the reform of the criminal justice system in the city of St. Louis. Unfortunately, I brought my anger with me, anger towards the apparent enemy. Yet I was surprised with uh, the faces that I saw in the crowd. There, were, there was sadness, but also unity. I watched as the community came together in prayers, solutions, and reflection. I was taken aback. The anger and visceral disposition that was displayed in the media was far from the sight I was witnessing. This was about solidarity with loss. I found hope in this m uh, movement and moment. I also watched the development of my students in, in the professional venue. I saw that while Ferguson incident was always president, present in their consciousness, uh, they were still focusing on learning, creating uh, relationships, and figuring out their sense of personal identity in a complex world. I took this example from the children. The best way to combat the ugly in this world is through decency and moving forward. Dr. Martin Luther King was an advocate for this shared vision of the American experience, a man entrenched in peaceful actions in resistance to an oppressive legal authority. This was a man who was not only teaching the moral and right message to the people, but also practicing the lessons provided. He sat in jail cells, he was protested, intimidated, intimidated, threatened, and forced to submit. He was murdered in cold blood. Yet as an American, as a man of God, and a man of peace, he never had a call to arms. His call was for love. I didn't see love post-Ferguson. I saw a line in the sand. On the one side, there was an uh, immediate defense against the immediate persecution of criminality, where on the other side, mourning, anger, and self-fulfilling prophecy of behaviors of the beleaguered. These were divisions propelled through the lack of respect and understanding. There are shared values seen in the American football player who kneels during the national anthem and protests uh, against an unequal state, a teenager who sits in the whites-only section of the diner in 1950, and the man who led a march to ensure future generations are allowed to be free of persecution. At one time or another, these acts often cr are often criticized as the wrong way to protest. So if it is at all wrong, why even practice peace? When once community and people continue to be pushed down, why not push back? If the example of Martin Luther King Jr. has taught us anything, it is that peace, not war, which accomplishes the most. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. challenged the people to channel their energy into useful and creative ways to display resistance and make the elite notice the difference people can make. Instead of burning Birmingham, Alabama to the ground, to try to weaken the uh, state-sponsored segregational policies. Dr. King used the power of economics to set up a transportation boycott that sent the city into turmoil. In effect, Birmingham changed its busing policies and started a wave of contemporary laws throughout the country. As Americans, we must remember that the power of intellect and resilience was the hallmark of the civil rights movement. It was not simply African Americans against the singular races throughout the South, it was people versus policy. I hope the promise of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s le enduring legacy can be acknowledged that while injustice feels uncomfortable, so does staying silent. As people, we must do our part to respect the rights of all our fellow Americans. Thank you. On behalf of the IVCC diversity team, I want to present you with this certificate for third place in the contest this year, Thank along you. with the check money for $50 and my handshake. Thank, Thank you very much. Our next winner of third place this year is Jabril Church. Jabril, would you come up, please? Okay. So I'm going to start the poem off uh, about the name. The name is in Swahili, Sunvan Africa. It is a uh, son of Africa. 
Before I begin, I would like to thank Amanda Cook Festerman for allowing me to speak and choosing my third place poem. Um, my father taught me at a young age that uh, I would face many disappointments and that I should not use, uh, lose the idea of infinite hope. I have been shut down constantly and I've spent countless uh, years being conditioned and hushed upon speaking about civil rights and what it means to be black in America. Prompting me to grow silent like my brothers and sisters, uh, but a wise man once taught me that our lives begin to end the day we grow silent to the things that matter. And in the end, we remember not the ferocious words of our adversaries, but the impactful silence of our friends. And so as I stand before you today, please understand that the measure of a man is not defined by their comfort and convenience, but where he stands in the face of challenge and conspiracy. Soon Von Africa. Color. What is the definition of color? Is it a hue to which an artist learns? Or is it what we use to label one another? Color, which is misused and mistreated. Delegations of all colors fumed and unappreciated. Culture is robbed, stripped naked of its youth. But if you're brown, does it mean it was taken from you? A black boy learning his new disposition. Living in a white man's world is the first transition. How do you think it makes me feel being labeled a monster based off my skin's heel? Being told my hair is a mess and I should perm? Pulling and tugging and tugging my African hair hurts. A teacher turning a blind eye to a racial bullying? Being the subject to disciplinary mulling. Coining a term called white silence. It's when a white person gets away with violence, but the only colored kid gets a negative highlight. You asked me to speak about my people's situation, but silenced me and placed me behind the privileged white people who complain about their nation? My pleas and cries covered up as lies, as annotation, telling me I should be grateful for my emancipation. Growing older, I only knew it would worsen. Oh, old, a white old woman clutching her person, these dark times you dare to wonder what is missing. Reporting to the world, yet no body of authority listens. I am soon Van Africa. You may oppress me, but I stand as Africa. Africa will rise up strong. There is a higher stand to which we belong. No, it won't be long. <laughs> Independence and equality for soon Van Africa. And I do have to make one correction. I, I don't actually judge the contest. Um, I'm really happy to put it on, though, but I will thank the people who did this year. Uh, we don't release the names, but they're faculty and staff at IVCC, so thank them. Uh, so we have a three-way tie for second place this year. So uh, our next uh, entrant uh, won second place, uh, and that is April Jording. So if April, you would come on up. And she, she promised me she's not going to pass out, right? I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I don't speak in front of people, so I'm going to speed read. <laughs> Most people, when looking at me, would never consider me a, or yeah, see, would cons never consider me one that would have to deal with civil rights on a daily basis. I am the stereotypical white girl, average looks, fluffy but not a beast, wearing a fleece North Face jacket, driving a minivan ugh, that may or may not be filled with fighting children. I can walk into either a Walmart or a boutique and not be looked at any different than any other mom looking for an outfit to wear for a date night without those fighting children. I do not worry when I get pulled over. I do not worry that I will be judged for what I am buying or how many kids I have if I look too intimidating or if I have to work extra hard at being charming at a job interview. Of course, no one should have to worry about any of those scenarios. Most of the time, those worries are unfounded. Most of the time. I know this because my appearance is deceiving. Almost seven years ago, I met this girl. She had this amazing hair that tumbled down her back in waves and curls. Beautiful September sky blue eyes, a dusting of freckles on her nose, and a smile that made anyone that caught it immediately smile back in return. She was charming and funny and smart in a way that you couldn't help but instantly want to be around her all day. 
I was in no way immune. In fact, I was pretty sure I was that boring person that fell in love with her within seconds. When she kissed me under a cherry tree dripping from the rain we were hiding from, I would have married her right then. Except I couldn't, since her name is Megan and mine is April. When we were allowed to be civil union, we plopped ourselves in front of the lady holding our papers and uh, signed our lives together. We were happy that we could have some of the same rights as married couples and a few worries dropped away. But there was still the nagging irritation that just because I loved someone that others didn't agree with, I couldn't have that paper that said, till death do us apart. I know it doesn't say that, but it's what my brain projected onto that ticket into the legality. Our lives carried on. We argued and made up, fought and loved fiercely, went through good times and bad, and collected another child on the way. And then it happened. We could legally be married. I, knew th I know that it sounds kind of silly. We were living the married life anyway, right? Kind of, but not really. There are a few bumps in the road. Things I would never have ever thought of that I had to fight, like insurance. I couldn't be on her insurance and vice versa. I technically could not take our son to the doctor or even get any medical information if something horrible happened. Because she carried him and I was not biologically or legally connected to him, I could have adopted him, but that felt like an insult to have to go to the length for a son that we had together. Our taxes could be filed together, but only with certain stipulations, and God forbid if one of us had died. Not only was there a chance that my son could be taken away, but also all of our possessions, anything in her name, like our vehicles or our house, and I would not be allowed to see her or have any care, say in her care for the health, unless a family member let me have a say. They would have for the most part, but it's the feeling that it's my right, our right, to make those kinds of decisions in our life together. Once again, we marched down to the courthouse and signed our lives away to each other. There was no ceremony, no white dress, no pretty flowers that sink to high heavens, just us and the same lady, and a piece of paper that said that I could fight all of the above with. I'd like to say that the piece of paper took away all of our problems. Of course they didn't. I still have to fight over little things with the insurance companies, with HIPAA laws, or what we do with taxes. Some days we're not even sure if our paper will be legal for long. The laws change in one day a state is legal, then the next it is not. With the new presidency, I cannot say that I'm not a little bit worried. My relationship with my wife would not change in the fact that I feel about her. She will always be my life with that piece of paper or not. But I am sure that it is my right to be able to hold on to that title as tight as I can. My marriage is just as valid as the two people three aisles over at Walmart bickering about what they are going to have for supper tonight. Both of their wedding rings glinting under the fluorescent lights. The only difference there should be between us and them which should be our choice of flavor of Hamburger Helper. Well, so thank you. And let me present you with this second place award for the Dr. Martin Luther King Writing Contest. Thank you. Very Check much. for $75. Thank you. Our next second place winner is Lisa Chenard Lewis. So if Lisa could come up. Hi. Can you hear me? My, t my poem is titled, Racism Painted Pretty. Racism painted pretty, called by any other name, is still a hate-filled story wrapped up inside our shame. Some call it narrow-minded, some call it preconceived. Some say they don't know better, it's what they're taught to believe. Racism can be hidden, presented in bright light, but even in the darkness we must stand for what is right. No matter what the color of your skin or of your eyes, racism painted pretty are pretty little lies. It is easy to stand tall when no seats are empty yet, but when the pressure's mounting, how quickly we forget. They say you'll fall for anything if nothing's where you stand. Racism painted pretty is still a ship unmanned. The glory of our freedom, the right for us to be, the reason that our flag flies high for you and him and me. The lives all lost by fighting and the ones in history. Racism painted pretty is what's killing us, you see. So all my sons and daughters, if your skin is sun-kissed brown, don't let the hatred take you. Don't let it keep you down. Martin Luther King and Malcolm Little, too, saw racism painted pretty in red and black and blue. But they still fought for justice until their lives did end. Still today we hold on to the message they did send. Racism painted pretty, called by any other name, is still a hate-filled story wrapped up inside our shame. No matter what the color of your skin or of your eyes, racism painted pretty are pretty little lies.
Lisa, on behalf of the IVCC diversity team, I want to present you with the second place award. <coughs> you and this check for seventy-five dollars. And if you have one free hand, a hand Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our last second place winner is Sam Brawley. So, Sam. Thanks for having me, everybody. Sorry I was late. All right. Let's see if I can get this up a little bit. All right, so I wrote a poem called The Fruits of My Land. All right. All right. I don't think this is going to go up any further. There we go. That's a little better. All right. America, the captivating daughter that catches the eye of all dinner guests. She has grown strong and beautiful, some whisper even more elegant than her mother, the queen, others dare to say. When the queen goes to give a toast, the princess interrupts. All at this table are welcome to gather the fruits of my land, America says. The guests who never, the guests who never speak hear her say all. The guests who were not invited hear her say welcome. The guests who are hungry hear her say, fruits. And so the people of different colors and costumes take all their courage to leave their homes for a distant idea. Others are ripped from their roots to serve those already planted in the new world. And no matter how they came to the daughter's land, all are greeted by the torches of those before them and the cold of countless strangers. But years build and fall like the grand icicles in the canyons and other colors and costumes make the journey to the daughter's land to relieve the citizen of that title of invader. All those who have come here, America says, have the right to pick fruit in the shade God has provided us. And this proclamation brightens the eyes of the newcomers and lets mothers smile hopefully at their children. And so the people from jungles and tundras and mountains find themselves together. Children of the cities living side by side can't understand each other, but they still seek to know their neighbors. Their games are puzzling, a girl might think. Their toys do not shine. America's children learn to reach for what was promised to them as their neighbors do the same. They become adults who work the fields picking fruit or take chances and buy the tree. Let me work, America's children chant, for in my sweat, with greatest sanity, I free the debt of my humanity. One day, just before the sun cracks open the night, neighbors never before seen enter the orchard, ready to test their brows against an implacable heat. America's children look at these figures in wonder. Are their bodies as strong as mine? Some ask, for some of these neighbors cannot walk. Can they tell what is rotten and what is ripe? Others ask, for some of these neighbors cannot see. Has God made them equal to me? Still others ask, for some of, the, for some of these neighbors are as different as the grass to sand. The voices of doubt are scattered at the dawn. Her children hear America say, let these divisions pass so that the harvest may be a bountiful one and a table can be set for all those willing to enter the field. Time does all it can to age her, but America, the great sentinel of inclusion, diversity and freedom, while never forgetting her wrongs against those who first planted the trees, hold strong to her responsibilities at the head of the world's table. Join the struggle, she says, ye of all colors and forms, walk with us if ye are able. Thank you. Sam, on behalf of the IVCC diversity team, I want to present you with a second place certificate. All right. Check for $75. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs>
Okay, our final two speakers are our tie for first place, so I want to invite up Stephanie Bias. Hey, how's it going? Um, I'm going to be speaking about fem feminism today. So it's a poem, and it's called To the Women That Say We Don't Need Feminism Anymore. Stop. Do you realize what you are saying? My skin crawls at the sound of your voice, at the privilege that drips from your lips. Feminism was needed in the 1900s. We have the right to vote, and we are equal to men under the law. Quit your bitching, you say. I'll never quit my bitching. Think about, think outside of your personal experience. Assume a different perspective, and your eyes will open. Open your eyes to genital mutilation, rape, and abuse. Think of the women of the world. Think of the child brides, rape victims, and sex slaves. Then think of the women who work just as hard as men, but are unequally compensated. Once you let go of your predispositions, you, are un you will understand that while many countries have made advances for women, there is still work to be done. Feminism works for the rights of women, men and children, the elderly and the disabled. Feminism works for anyone with a heartbeat. But most importantly, feminism gave you the rights that you have today and will give you the rights that you will have in the future. Work with us, not against us. Thank you. Diversity team, I present you with this first place certificate, a check for $100, Thank you. and a handshake. Thank you. Our final presenter also is tied for first place, and so I'd like to invite up Nicholas Needs. Hi, uh, my essay is titled, Electing to Choose Justice. Coming off of an election that featured two candidates whose campaigns caused severe turbulence and separation between American citizens, one might be more apt to appreciate the right to express his or her opinions through voting. However, imagine the emotion that an individual might experience if that ability to express his or her opinion, like the majority of the American public, was to be revoked. Sadly, due to state legislation, this unjust, hypothetical situation is a reality for a portion of American citizens who suffer from mental illness. Federal legislation needs to be passed in order to secure the right to vote for eligible American citizens who suffer from mental illnesses. Currently, the laws regarding the ability for an American citizen who is labeled mentally ill are subject to the discernment of each state's legislature. One of the major flaws with this understanding is the difference between citizens who are labeled mentally ill and mentally competent. In some states, there is legislation preventing mentally incompetent indiv individuals from voting, while allowing others who suffer from mental illnesses that do not compromise their ability to vote in a conscious manner the right to vote. This distinguishing between the two is a vital aspect of the legislation as withholding the right to vote from an ind individual who has been deemed unable to effectively vote in a conscious manner is seemingly justifiable. However, withholding the same right strictly on the basis that an individual has a mental illness is unjust. According to a study of the rights that mentally ill people are granted in each state, 25 states have elected to deny this demographic group their right to vote. Due to the varying cultures and traditional beliefs that are found dispersed throughout the different regions of the country, the rights that the mentally ill community receive are not equal in all states. Also, by giving individual state legislatures the choice to either grant or restrict their mentally ill populations the right to vote, blatant discrimination against the affected group is made politically acceptable. Such discrimination is unwarranted and unjust as it deprives capable Americans of their human rights. By taking away their right to vote, individual state governments are recognizing that people with mental illnesses do not deserve to exercise the same rights that are guaranteed to their fellow citizens of the United States. In the suit of Bush versus Gore, it was determined by the Supreme Court that voting is a fundamental right in America. It is only right that American citizens who are mentally competent of forming an opinion on a voting manner and then casting their vote in support of whichever side they identify with be able to cast that vote. By withholding such a right from certain groups of people, state legislatures are acting in a manner that has been deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Beyond the political correctness of the matter, the human dignity of the individuals who are denied their right to vote is damaged by their restrictive laws. Craig Hemmings stated that 
Scholarly literature has recognized the socially debilitating effects, including stigmatization and informal discrimination, of holding a deviant status. When the right to vote is taken away from mentally ill individuals, the message that they are of a lower status than the greater majority of other American citizens who are allowed to openly exercise that right is sent. The right to vote is a human right, not a social right, and thus should be provided to individuals as long as they are competent of making conscious decisions on what they are voting for. Federal legislation that secures voting rights for citizens with mental illness would serve as a perfectly suitable alternative to the severely flawed system that is currently utilized among state governments. This discriminatory legislation that select states have implemented is demeaning to the community of people who suffer from mental illnesses and should not simply be accepted because it is the current status quo. The individuals who are being discriminated against in this situation are dignified human beings and citizens of the United States. Thus, they deserve to be allowed to exercise their rights. If there was federal legislation in place, people with mental illnesses nationwide would receive the same treatment and be able to exercise the same rights in each state, something that is important in protecting the dignity of human lives. For example, by state law, an individual who has a mental illness and lives in Minnesota does not have the right to vote. However, if the same individual resides a foot across the border in Wisconsin, he or she would have full voting rights. Allowing the individual state legislatures to determine whether citizens of that state suffering from mental illnesses are allowed to vote or not is illogical and certainly a grave injustice to those who are affected. Through, legis through federal legislation, the inconsistencies that arise among the state legislatures would be able to be vanquished and justice would prevail throughout the nation. The ability of an individual to express his or her opinions and represent him or herself through voting is a necessary right to have and the only way to ensure that all capable citizens receive this right is through federal legislation. People suffering from mental illnesses are still able to form opinions on, manners, on matters and thus should be able to support those sides as long as they are deemed mentally competent. It is the duty of the American people to preserve the rights that the nation's forefathers fought to acquire for the common good many years ago. Included in this task is to speak up for the unheard. Thus, federal laws should be instituted to provide full voting rights for American citizens affected by mental illness. Thank you. Nick, on behalf of the IGCC diversity team, I want to present you with a certificate for first place. A check for one hundred dollars, and thank you so much. Thank you. So as you to write about. You don't have to be a great writer, you just have to have a great idea. So uh, I encourage you to enter, and if you won this year, you can enter again next year. So uh, don't be discouraged at all. So thank you for coming, and I don't. I think our pizza's all gone, but if you want to talk to the winners and mingle for a little bit, uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Yeah.